Uh, whether you uh, support me or whether you think I'm the dumbest guy on earth, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, this is uh, really, really important. One of the things that uh, I helped lead a group of freshmen to insist on was that this thing not get pushed through too quickly. I wanted August to be a month-long conversation with the American people. This is our sixth town hall meeting in six, the last six days. Um, we are doing 18 this month, as well as lots of meetings with the Chambers of Commerce, with stakeholders, with doctors and others, uh, to make sure this is a, a great conversation. So I'm really glad everyone's here. Uh, secondly, I do want to get to the questions very quickly. Uh, let me just say that I think this is a place where people can genuinely disagree. I don't think anyone here is a mobster or an extremist or anything else. Uh, this is an important, uh, important uh, disagreement to have. Um, I also think that the president and others who are pushing the reform, uh, like those who are opposed to it, are genuinely doing what they believe is going to make the country stronger. Now we disagree, and we disagree on what that, what that approach is. We can disagree on what that approach is, uh, but I think that there are good people trying to oppose this because they think it's important, and good people who are trying to promote it because they think it's important. So far in our first five town halls, um, we have had very strong and substantive disagreement, um, but everything has stayed below a boil, um, and that's been a good thing. We haven't made any of the late night shows yet, so uh, we're hoping that maybe we can continue that today. So without further ado, let me go ahead and hand it off to y'all, and then we'll try to start the conversation. I don't have a problem taking the public option, but here's the point. It's a misunderstanding of what the bill is about. The bill is not telling people they have to take a plan. It's giving people a set of choices. So if you're on the exchange... This is the bill. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hold it together. So this is, this is what it says. The exchange for those 47 million uninsured is essentially a grocery store where insurance companies can bid to be on the shelf, and if you're in that category where you qualify, you can go down that aisle and you can look at the shelves and you can pick. And every insurance company can compete for that business. There may or may not be a public option, which I know people have strong feelings about. But that's the idea, is that. Now the second question is, do you want to create a premium platinum plan, or do you want to create a, a range of plans or a basic plan for people to be able to buy into. Well, that 23-year-old uh, who has gotten knocked off their family plan may have a very different desire than the 55-year-old. So it's about having a range of plans and range of options for different people. Now, the, the, big, the big issue, I think the single biggest issue probably, probably the two biggest issues for the people uh, in this room, I would guess. One is a lot of concern about the Medicare cuts and whether seniors are going to be protected. And the second is, for those of us who like the insurance we have, are we going to be able to keep it? Now, every hospital I've met with in Central and Southside Virginia, which I think is every one but one so far, says, look, we're, our entire bottom line right now is whether we can make more off our private insurance clients than we lose on our uninsured. So those premiums are going up through the roof because every time they're more uninsured going through those doors, they have to make up for that loss. So they're saying, look, if you can get me anything, even if it was 70 cents on the dollar instead of 5 cents on the dollar for those uninsured, then that's basically net profit that takes that pressure off of all of us that have seen our premiums go up 14%. But that only works if I'm not losing my bread and butter, which is the private insurance. So this is, I think, the crux of the bill is can we do that or can we not? And I think there's a set of people who believe we can't. There's a set of people who believe we can have a system where we do something to get these people. They're not getting it for free, that $47 million. If you're above 130% of poverty, you're, you're buying a health care plan without losing the, the insurance. So again, and the idea, I think the people that, are, that have been behind this vision genuinely believe that we can do that. Now, the, the tension is, how do you do it? Private companies drop their insurance all the time. One of the things that I've heard the most when I was going around the 5th District talk, talking to small business owners saying, uh, and this will come to the corporate tax thing in a second, you know, what are your biggest barriers right now? Having a workforce that's ready to go and skyrocketing health care costs have been two of the most crushing things for our small business owners. 
And these, of course, are business owners who know the name of every employee. They know their spouse's name. They know the kid's name. They do not want to cut that insurance com coverage to their workers. But if it keeps going up at 14% a year, they simply can't afford to do it. So again, I think that question is, is there a way to get that pressure off of all of us who are already paying into the system by getting some of the people that aren't paying into the system into the mix? And I think you know people can disagree on whether that's going to happen, but I think that's the goal of it. In terms of the, of the legalese... You're not going to drop the plan. You didn't answer the question. Yes or no? We, no. We, the, the, the amendment that passed on Friday gives Congress the choice. We will have that choice that we are offering to other people. And the whole point of the bill is choice. Again, again, you're, the, problem, the problem is you're asking the wrong question. The question is based on the assumption... The issue is we are trying to create choices for people that don't currently have choices. We're not going to go into your private insurance company if you're already covered and say you have to take this option or you have to do this thing. The idea is creating choices for people who don't currently have choices. Let me explain, let me explain something. Just give me a second. I, I doubt you'll agree with me by the end, but give me a second to say it. Cap and trade, cap and trade was a Republican idea. The first President Bush used it to solve the acid rain problem that was the most efficient and effective environmental law ever written. Because it used capitalism. The whole idea is instead of the government going out and saying, you've got to add this scrubber, this regulation, this command and control, it said, here's the end goal, and we're going to let you compete and make lots of money on figuring out how to solve this problem because we're better at that than anyone else. So. John McCain, uh, former Senator John Warner, supported this as the solution for cap-and-trade because it's a market-based solution. The idea is not to go and tell people um, how this is going to go. So you asked how it's going to help Bedford. Well, for one thing, we're building nuclear reactors for the first time in 30 years. Well, for one thing, we're building nuclear reactors for the first time in 30 years. Well, for one thing, we're building nuclear reactors for the first time in 30 years, which I think is a great thing. A lot of people in Bedford County go into Lynchburg and work at Areva and B&W, and the renaissance of the nuclear industry in this country, I think, is an excellent idea. So those are a good thing. Drill is fine. I've got no problem with drilling. Drilling is fine. But drilling continues... Drilling is fine, but it, drilling continues to perpetuate a petro-based economy that Chavez and Ahmadinejad, they love it when we drill. Because what it says to them is that we're not serious about getting off the thing that is their lifeline. So if we're serious about this issue, we can. We can. The limitation on drilling right now, drilling's been handed to the states. Drilling's been handed to the states, and the states aren't doing it for a variety of reasons. Political. Some are that the market won't bear it at the price of petroleum right now. So I don't have an ideological problem with it. Here's the other thing we're doing. We are making the biggest investment ever in clean coal technology, carbon capture and sequestration technology. The two biggest possessors of coal are the U.S. and China. The two biggest consumers of coal are the U.S. and China. I don't believe for a second that one of us isn't going to crack that technology, and I sure as heck would rather it be the United States and we export that stuff to China than wait for them to invent it and import it back in. So we can disagree on this, but I think this was a great thing for national security, a great thing for jobs in the area. Hey, Congressman, uh, Eagles, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak. First off, the preference for unions. Right. Um, I have read in the bill that union health care will not be taxed, but people that are non-union members, their health care will be taxed. <laughs> Virginia is a right-to-work state. I've never belonged to a union in my life, and I don't know anybody that lives around here that does. Um, second, the, also in line with the union, is that additionally the federal government will provide funding for five years 
for union retirees upon their retirement. Offset the medical cost to the company. And this isn't just unions, this is also community organizations like ACORN. I don't think that, a, that an organization that is being taken to court for voter fraud all over the nation should get one cent of my money. Not one cent. And this is just a statement, sir. I really don't need a response because you've given me many. Um, is I do not support any public health care plan at all. I do believe 